The gods more than once made a race of men. The first was a golden race. Very close to the gods who dwell on Olympus was this golden race. They lived justly, although there were no laws to compel them. In the time of the golden race, the earth knew only one season, and that season was everlasting spring. The men and women of the golden race lived through a span of life that was far beyond that of the men and women of our day. And when they died, it was as though sleep had become everlasting with them. They had all good things and that without labor for the earth without any forcing bestowed fruits and crops upon them. They had peace all through their lives, this golden race. And after they had passed away, their spirits remained above the earth, inspiring the men of the race that came after them to do great and gracious things and to act justly and kindly to one another. After the golden race had passed away, the gods made for the earth a second race, a silver race. Less noble in spirit and in body was this silver race and the seasons that visited them were less gracious. In the time of the silver race, the gods made the seasons, summer and spring and autumn and winter. They knew parching heat and the bitter winds of winter and snow and rain and hail. It was the men of the silver race who first built houses for shelter. They lived through a span of life that was no longer than, they lived through a span of life that was longer than our span but it was not long enough to give wisdom to them. Children were brought up at their mother's sides for a hundred years, playing at childish things. And when they came to years beyond a hundred, they quarreled with one another and wronged one another and did not know enough to give reverence to the immortal gods. Then by the will of Zeus, the silver race passed away as the golden race had passed away. Their spirits stayed in the underworld, and they are called by men the blessed spirits of the underworld. And then there was made the third race, the race of bronze. They were a great race of stature, terrible and strong. They were a race great of stature, terrible and strong. Their armor was of bronze, their swords were of bronze, their implements were of bronze, and of bronze too, they made their houses. No great span of life was theirs, for with the weapons that they took in their terrible hands, they slew one another. Thus they passed away and went down under the earth to Hades, leaving no name that men might know them by. Then the gods created a fourth race, our own, a race of iron. We have not the justice that was amongst the men of the golden race, nor the simpleness that was amongst the men of the silver race, nor the stature, nor the great strength that the men of the bronze race possessed. We are of iron that we may endure. It is our doom that we must never cease from labor and that we must very quickly grow old. But miserable as we are today, there was a time when the lot of men was more miserable. With poor implements, they had to labor on a hard ground. There was less justice and kindliness amongst men in those days than there is now. Once it came into the mind of Zeus that he would destroy the fourth race and leave the earth to the nymphs and the satyrs. He would destroy it by a great flood, but Prometheus, the Titan God who had given aid to Zeus against the other Titans, Prometheus, who was called the Foreseer, could not consent to the race of men being destroyed utterly, and he considered a way of saving them. And he considered a way of saving some of them. To a man and a woman, Deucalion and Pyrrha, just and gentle people, he brought word of the plan of Zeus and he showed them how to make a ship that would bear them through what was about to be sent upon the earth. Then Zeus shut up in their cave all the winds but the wind that brings rain and clouds. He bade this wind, the south wind, sweep over the earth, flooding it with rain. He called upon Poseidon 
and bade him to let the sea pour in upon the land. And Poseidon commanded the rivers to put forth all their strength and sweep dikes away and overflow their banks. The clouds and the sea and the rivers poured upon the earth. The flood rose higher and higher and in the places where the pretty lambs had played, the ugly sea calves now gambled. Men in their boats drew fishes out of the tops of elm trees, and the water nymphs were amazed to come on men's cities under the waves. Soon even the men and women who had boats were overwhelmed by the rise of water. All perished then, except Deucalion and Pyrrha, his wife. Them the waves had not overwhelmed, for they were in a ship that Prometheus had shown them how to build. The flood went down at last, and Deucalion and Pyrrha climbed up to a high and dry ground. Zeus saw that two of the race of men had been left alive, but he saw that these two were just and kindly and had a right reverence for the gods. He spared them, and he saw their children again peopling the earth. Prometheus, who had saved them, looked upon the men and women of the earth with compassion. Their labor was hard, and they wrought much to gain little. They were chilled at night in their houses, and the winds that blew in the daytime made the old men and women bend double like a wheel. Prometheus thought to himself that if men and women had the element that only the gods knew of, the element of fire, they could make for themselves implements for labor, they could build houses that would keep out the chilling winds, and they could warm themselves at the blaze. But the gods had not willed that men should have fire, and to go against the will of the gods would be impious. Prometheus went against the will of the gods. He stole fire from the altar of Zeus, and he hid it in a hollow fennel stalk, and he brought it to men. Then men were able to hammer iron into tools and cut down forests with axes and sow grain where the forests had been. Then they were able to make houses that the storms could not overthrow and they were able to warm themselves at hearth fires. They had rest from their labor at times. They built cities. They became beings who no longer had heads and backs bent but were able to raise their faces even to the gods. And Zeus spared the race of men who had now the sacred element of fire, but he knew that Prometheus had stolen this fire even from his own altar and had given it to men. And he thought on how he might punish the great Titan God for his impiety. He brought back from the underworld the giants that he had put there to guard the titans that had been hurled down to Tartarus. He brought back Gaius, Cotus, and Briarius, and he commanded them to lay hands upon Prometheus and to fasten him with fetters to the highest, blackest crag upon Caucasus. And Briarius, Cotus, and Gaius seized upon the titan god and carried him to Caucasus and fettered him with fetters of bronze to the highest, blackest crag, with fetters of bronze that may not be broken. There they left the titan stretched under the sky with the cold winds blowing upon him and with the sun streaming down on him. And that his punishment might exceed all other punishments, Zeus had sent a vulture to prey upon him, a vulture that tears at his liver each day. And yet, Prometheus does not cry out that he has repented of his gift to man. Although the winds blow upon him, and the sun streams upon him, and the vulture tears at his liver, Prometheus will not cry out his repentance to heaven, and Zeus may not utterly destroy him. For Prometheus the foreseer knows a secret that Zeus would fain have him disclose. He knows that even as Zeus overthrew his father and made himself the ruler in his stead, 
so too another will overthrow Zeus. And one day Zeus will have to have the fetters broken from around the limbs of Prometheus and will have to bring from the rock and will have and will have to bring from the rock and the vulture and into the council of the Olympians, the unyielding Titan God. So Prometheus sacrificed himself to a degree for men and women who had to suffer and have really hard lives and it wasn't really their fault. But he knows that his suffering is temporary. He knows that everything changes eventually. He knows there will be a changing of the guard. He knows there will be a turn of the wheel of fortune. And overall, it sounds like he's pleased with the, with the gift that he gave mankind and it sounds to me too like he feels satisfied that they took his gift and ran with it and created structure for themselves that they can rely upon and build on. What do you think is the meaning of this story? Also in the East, they talk about different ages of, of mankind. In the first age, um, called the Sati Yuga, everyone was good and kind and honest, like the golden race spoken of in this story. And then the next couple ages of mankind, you know, people kind of, uh, degenerate, you know, in their both physical and moral stature. And it is said that now we are in the Kali Yuga, where life is harder for virtuous people and is easier or more welcoming for demons. I can see that. I can see that playing out. And therefore, in this Iron Age or a Kali Yuga that we live in now, I can distinguish myself. I have the opportunity more than ever to distinguish myself in the eyes of God or the gods, or the higher energies, by remembering who I am by remembering them, by remembering God, by asking myself what would be the right thing to do, not what would be the profitable thing to do, not what would be the easy thing to do, what would be the right thing to do. And doing that to as great of a degree as I can when no one's looking and there's not going to be any reward for me. I think that in a time of darkness, I think in a time of darkness, the self-respect and sense of, uh, you know, feeling proud of oneself for doing the right thing is, um, is even greater. When you have a sense of what we are all really up against in this world at this time, you can't help but, I mean, I can't help but have admiration for people who do the right thing anyway. And, you know, at, at first you might feel alone in, in working to be one of those people, but the longer you do it, then you'll naturally attract to yourself the other people who actually want to do something good and have a good life and uh, help others, you know, help relieve suffering, um, help bring knowledge. The story of Prometheus and him giving mankind fire, one metaphor in that is that he gave them knowledge. 
He gave them the light of knowledge you know, so that they could shine the light on the darkness uh, using their own free will. There's a lot more that could be said about this story. So let me know what's on your mind and what you guys think. This is one of my favorite stories.